Hello and welcome to this short video talking about the inverted posture in the horse. So my name is Dr Gillian Tabor, I'm a chartered physiotherapist and I specialise in the treatment and the rehabilitation of horses. So I'm going to talk you through the topic of postures and in this one we're going to talk about the inverted posture. So in the horse that's got an inverted posture, what we'll see is a raised head and neck position. So we have the pole higher than the withers, and this can be sort of a varying degrees. What we do have is we have the head in front of the vertical, but actually we see that it is more than would be desired in a competition outline to so in a dressage frame. So it might be you know, 30 degrees in front of the vertical rather than being just sat so about five degrees in front of it. As we go down the neck, what we often see is the uh, small amount of muscle on the top half of the neck along the dorsal chain of muscles. And then we have more of a, a, a greater muscle bulk in the lower half of the neck. So um, we get overdevelopment and sometimes we get bulging of those muscles. As you look at the horse from side on, you'll see that there's a real convexity to the lower line of the neck. And then when we travel back through the spine, what we'll see is a horse that has a hollowed or a dipped back. Technically, this is called a lordosis, and it is where the back is in more of an extended position than we'd actually uh, want to see. So what that means is that the uh, spinous processes of the withers and of the lumbar region sit much higher than those in the middle section, sort of underneath where the saddle is in that caudal thoracic spine. What we also see is that the position of the thoracolumbar spine influences the junction between the spine and the pelvis, which is the lumbar sacral junction, and then that sits in a more extended position. And then as the pelvis is attached onto that sacrum, we'll see that the pelvis is rotated forward and um, that's called a, a cranial rotation of the pelvis. So we'll see that the point of the buttocks is uh, higher. So if we picture a, a horse that's got a rounded back and then a tilted pelvis in the other direction, that's when the horse is uh, in a more sitting and engaged position. Because of this rotation of the pelvis, then what we will see is the hip isn't orientated as um, further, further, further forward as it would be. And so the hind limb then is more likely to be out behind the horse. Now, Biomechanically, we'd see the um, hind limb more retracted usually, but in some horses, what they do is they compensate for this sort of altered posture by camping under and bringing their hind legs forward. And then either of those positions with the leg out behind or uh, camped forward underneath is going to have a knock on effect onto the foot balance in those hind feet. And thinking about the forelegs now, uh, this can be sort of slightly variable. In, in some horses, you see that the whole weight of the horse is shifted forward. So they look like the foreleg isn't vertical. Uh, in fact, the sort of shoulders are um, pushing forwards and the horse is leaning forwards. Uh, but in some horses, we might see that the leg is vertical and um, this isn't affected so much. We often consider that the horse that is inverted might have a sunken thoracic sling. So the chest is actually sitting lower between the shoulder blades than we'd like. And this combination of extension in the thoracolumbar spine, the high head carriage and the effect on the thoracic sling might actually result in the whole rib cage being rotated. And if you've got a horse that is um, sort of been in this posture for a long time, you might find actually that the sternum then is pushing forward and is quite obviously protruded. So this sort of inverted posture uh, is something that is unfortunately is linked with problems with the horse and um, what we need to do is, is to consider why that might be and what we can do about it. 
So in the horse that's got an inverted posture and the head is raised and it is held raised, then one of the main effects is actually on the position of the back. The back then in an extended position means that the spinous processes are actually closer together. And we've got some research of x-rays with horses in a, a high head carriage, a neutral head carriage and low head carriage. And those with a high head carriage actually showed that there was reduced gaps between those spinous processes. We then can uh, have that leading to crowding of those spinous processes and then potentially the issue of kissing spines. Although it can be cause or effect or effect and cause. So if the horse is in that position and the spinous processes get closer together, that might create kissing spines. But if a horse has kissing spines, then it might want to hold itself in that position because actually lengthening through that top line is going to be painful. So they then uh, re, um, you know, it's a cycle then that they go into this posture and then they stay in the posture. We get tension in the long back muscles in the thoracolumbar region, and it can be that this is maintaining the horse in an extended position, or actually it is a protective mechanism. But tension in those long back muscles then will cause uh, more extension, and it'll actually mean that it's difficult for the horse to lengthen through that top line, either longitudinally, so them going longer uh, on both sides, or actually when you're going around on the circle and you want the outside main back muscle to get longer. So this main back muscle that we're talking about is longissimus, but also in the area you've got iliocostalis, spinalis and multifidus that sit in a more, uh, more um, spinal by spinal level, sort of segmental level. So to raise the head up, the horse is going to have to uh, contract some muscles. It's going to overuse the muscles. And one of them that then has a slightly altered way of moving is the uh, muscle on the base of the neck. So the brachiocephalicus and to a certain extent, the sternocephalicus as well. So that's why you might get this bulging on the base of the neck and where a muscle is working really hard, the body will adapt and compensate for it. So it will actually gain more mass in that muscle to try and um, help it work more efficiently and so we get this overdevelopment at the base of the neck. If the muscle is overworking and getting tired it might get sore and then you get tension through that muscle as well. Often you might see uh, in the poll region and the upper cervical region overdevelopment of the muscles at the top of the head as the horse is using those to keep that head up. We do know as a consequence of raising the head, it has an effect on the mechanics of the thoracolumbar spine, and also it has a knock-on effect onto the action of the hind limbs. And this has been studied in both re re ridden horses and unridden horses, where they manipulated the head and neck position to see what would happen through the rest of the body. And they showed that there was much more of an effect on the rest of the body when the head was high than it was in various positions when it was low. And the main effect on um, the back was this extended position, but also we ended up with some of the back going into extension and some of it going into flexion because it's a chain. And so you have um, one effect in one region, it's going to have to then have a secondary effect in another region. But the hind stride length was then shortened and the, the legs were less able to be brought forward underneath the body. So as we are walking and we're moving, we want engagement of the hind legs. We want the hind leg to step up and forward underneath the body. But if it is unable to because, say, the rib cage can't get out of the way because the muscles aren't allowing that lateral shift of the rib cage, which should happen as the legs swing forward, uh, if we're not getting the flexion in the lumbar sacral region to allow the hind leg to step underneath, then that is a, a consequence. Uh, as a consequence, we then end up with the shortened hind limb step length. So you can see that the knock on effects to having an inverted posture is then going to affect the biomechanics. So why might we get an inverted posture? Well, if a horse is 
uh, in the wild and it spots something that it, it feels that it is a threat, then it will raise its head to put its eyes in a more efficient position to be able to see what might be uh, predating it. And therefore the head up is a you know, useful position for it. But the horse will only spend short durations in that position because we know that horses have to graze for long durations, so their head will go down back down to the grass. So it might be that your horse in a uh, situation where it feels threatened, the fight, flight and flight, <laughs> flight and fight mechanism kick in and the head raise up. But then if you're in a constant state of an alarm situation, the horse is fearful, it feels challenged, it's not comfortable in its surroundings then the head will likely stay up into that high position. It might be that the horse is untrained and uh, the conformation of the horse is such that it's likely to have a high head carriage and therefore it might stay up in that position during the ridden work that you do with it. In which case you're going to get more of that position because it, the more that we train in one way then the horse is going to stay in that position and then that then will have uh, the effect that this is a, a normal postural habit and then it will stay in this position. And and certainly when you get into that cycle of the horse spending long durations of time, then the adaptation to the muscles in that position then become sort of more firm. Um, it becomes a more of a dominant position. And then that subsequently means that you're going to have more time spent in that position than you want to. And then, as I said, if you've got pain in the back, if you've got shortening of those long back muscles because they are going into a protective spasm, uh, they will then reinforce this position of a hollowed and lowered back. And when you've got a hollowed and lower back, then consequently, it's going to be very difficult for your horse to lengthen and lower its head and neck. And so the head will stay up into this high position. If you've got a horse that is uh, tendency has a tendency to uh, rush around, to be tense, to be anxious, um, you are more likely to be in this position than you've, if you've got a sort of lower energy, relaxed horse that is able to uh, have its head in a lower head and neck position. So to a certain extent, the, the temperament of the horse might predispose it to be more in this posture. The other thing that we have to consider is conformation. Now, some horses have a very high set on neck and they have the sort of genetic predisposition to not build or carry much top line and therefore they are going to use the muscles that they've got and so they're going to dominate by the lower neck muscles, the ones at the top of the neck and uh, try and sort of compensate for their conformation by overusing the back muscles rather than switching on the abdominal muscles and the muscles of underneath the spine to engage those hind legs and to lift the back into a carrying position. So conformation does play a huge part of it. Um, and some horses, it is part of their desired conformation and actually their breed standards might say that they actually have this sort of proud high head carry. And I don't want to name any specific breeds um, because, um, you know, it's not necessarily wrong for those breeds. However, it does contradict with what we're trying to achieve if we're trying to perhaps put our horse in a dressage frame or even work it in a position where the head and neck is lower if the conformation is such that it's not uh, in you know, sort of starting out from that position. And when we think about it, people spend an awful lot of money buying a foal that is bred for the confirmation that makes it so much easier to do the job that we want it to be in. So if we think about, you know, a dressage horse, you might have a horse that's got a higher withers than a croup, so it's going to be generally more uphill. It might actually have a length of neck that um, positions it into a sort of dressage outline from birth. You know, we see horses that are, are flying around the field on the bit, if you like, compared with that horse that is um, spooky and has a high head carriage and is inverted and um, isn't in a, a dressage frame. So confirmation plays a part. And um, yeah, we've got that cycle of pain as well, that probably is something that I see more frequently than um, confirmation, because we can't change confirmation, but we can change posture and we can most certainly have an influence on pain. 
So in summary, the reason that people have such um, an interest in this inverted posture and are trying to change it with their in-hand work or with their ridden work is because of the effect it has on the biomechanics. So if you've got a raised head carriage, we know that those spinous processes come closer together. We know that if we have a raised head carriage, then we're going to affect the gait pattern, that hind limb, that ability for it to engage and step underneath the body. If we've got tension in the base of the neck through the brachiocephalic and sternocephalicus, then the thoracic sling isn't going to be able to work effectively to lift up and um, draw the ribcage up between those scapula as we would like. And also the, um, the back muscles, if they are really tense and tight and switched on, we're going to have that extended back position, but also we're then going to have the difficulty in lengthening it. We're going to have the difficulty in the longitudinal flexion so the head and neck carriage going forward down and out um, and also us being able to achieve a lateral bend so lengthening through a short tight muscle is going to be a lot harder than if we've got something that is soft and relaxed so our lateral bend and the rotation and side flexion that we need through that region um, that we sit on is going to be challenging. The consequences and the causes, um, I don't like to say that um, where we've got an association, we're going to have a causation into back pain, but I certainly see the more horses in this position that are ones that have kissing spine pathology and have back pain. So I think um, I would be hesitant to say what caused what in every case, unless I knew the horse long term, but there's definitely a relationship between this inverted posture and pathology in the back. And then the next question is, what can you do about it? Well, in an ideal world, what we'd say is, right, just lower the head and neck, let's lift up through the back and through the thoracic sling, step underneath us, uh, so step the hind legs underneath the horse and you'll be sorted. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. Certainly, if we've got pain, uh, we need to address that. We need to allow the range of motion. We need to be confident that the horse can achieve where we want it to go before we start asking for it in training. We want to consider the confirmation as well. As I said, we can't change that, but what can we optimize for the horse that we've got in front of us? It might mean that our horse is not going to uh, be able to maintain those positions for a long time initially, and uh, we need to consider that when we set up our training plan. And certainly when we've got an inverted posture and we've got the horse hollowing um, underneath the saddle, then my opinion is the first sort of call of training is once we know that the horse can achieve that movement stationary, try to achieve it dynamically, but without the weight of the rider as an influence on top of it. So we want to do in hand work, we want to do ground work, and there's so much that we can do with postural re-education uh, from the ground. So I'd urge anybody that is concerned that they have a horse that's in this inverted posture to consider all different approaches to try and uh, achieve um, resolution away from the horse that is um, in this sort of upside down position. And then the other thing to think about is the horse's mental state as well. A horse that is fearful, is over aroused because of their environment or other factors. Um, it could be internal pain as well. So uh, we mustn't forget that outside my scope of practice, but we need to consider whether the horse has something like ulcers or whether the foot balance is OK. Um, is the nutrition on point? So all these issues that might cause a horse to be in this sort of generalized state of uh, over alert and have the head and neck in this um, up position. Those are the things that we need to address with perhaps with professional help as well. So I hope that was interesting for you, a bit of a rundown as to my thoughts about the inverted posture. As always, you know, please do contact me. I'm on social media at Dr. Gillian Table Physio. So uh, just drop me a message. You can either you know, comment underneath this post uh, or send me a direct message. That's absolutely fine. So thank you very much for your time listening. And um, yeah, I hope to catch you in my uh, next uh, videos.